Good afternoon, North Dakota, and welcome. Uh, grateful for your presence. It's another beautiful day in North Dakota. We've got a lot of information, a lot of positive information. Uh, we appreciate those of you that have been tuning in regularly uh, during this entire pandemic. Uh, going back to March, uh, we appreciate your uh, efforts to focus on facts, not fear, and your understanding that we have a dual mission, which is to save lives and livelihoods. And uh, truly, as we uh, enter this uh summer period in the pandemic uh, gives us a chance uh, here in North Dakota to reflect uh, some more about how we are all truly in it together uh, with our interconnected humanity uh, because our own actions, uh, while they may be life-saving and protect our own health, uh, certainly at this period of time, uh, our actions can affect others. And this is particularly important to understand uh, the correlation between what we do individually and what we do collectively. Uh, because of COVID-19, as we've talked about at previous conferences, the risk is spread so unevenly, and we'll talk a little bit about that at the opening. Our goal all along has been to protect the most vulnerable among us and those that are elderly and with underlying health conditions because uh, if you are elderly with underlying health conditions, COVID-19 uh, is not just a uh, <clears throat> something that is... Uh, that you don't want to catch it is something that is actually factually can be quite deadly for people. Uh, and we've talked a lot about this again in the individual responsibility, which call, we call the, you know, the North Dakota smart, uh, which North Dakotans on their individual responsibility have done a great job through this. And whether that's, uh, you know, proper social distancing, uh, good hand hygiene, uh, wearing masks when appropriate. Uh, but as we go forward, we've also got a collective responsibility to care uh, for each other, our teammates at work, our family members, uh, the students uh, that we interact with and the teachers who teach us, uh, and especially as we focus on uh on moving towards uh, more full visitation at our long-term care, uh, where we ha where many of the our most vulnerable live, uh, it's very important that we're exercising that collective responsibility. And uh, and the, and some along the way, people have said, "Hey, this is really like the flu." Uh, but if you have the flu, whatever age you are, you generally know it because if you have the flu, you feel bad, you've got flu-like symptoms, uh, and you probably are feeling such a way that you would probably choose to stay home uh, versus you know try to tough it out or go someplace. But with COVID-19, particularly if you're younger, you can have it, you can be contagious, you can be spreading a deadly virus and not even know it. Uh, yesterday during our call with the White House Coronavirus Task Force led by Vice President Pence, uh, in addition on that call were Secretary Azar uh, and Seema Verma, who leads C CMS, uh, and Dr. Burks, Admiral Gerard, Admiral Polochek, and others. But Dr. Burks was sharing that what we know now that we didn't know three months ago is that uh, it's an estimated that somewhere between 50 and 70 percent of the positives of people People under age 30 may have no symptoms or mild symptoms and mild enough that they may not even feel like that they're uh, you know have anything that would cause them to not go to work or go out or do whatever so we have a again this uh, this, this deadly disease for people that are elderly with underlying conditions, and you can have it when you're younger and not even know it. Again, this is very different than the flu or other uh, things that have been experienced in the past, and that's why, again, uh, COVID-19 risk uh, really spreads uh, unevenly. When we take a look at the confirmed uh, cases in North Dakota, 58% of the people who've had it are between the ages of 20 to 29, but the deaths with COVID-19, 62% percent of them are people that are over age 80 or over. And that's why it's important for you to know your status, uh, particularly if you're young and healthy. We appreciate that a lot of younger, healthy people came uh, in the past week uh, to get tested. Uh, and particularly if you're planning on having close contact with vulnerable populations, uh, we encourage uh, everyone to continue to take advantage of free testing opportunities as they're available. And of course, if you are uh, symptomatic, see your health care provider uh, 
and also make sure you get tested. And if you're symptomatic, uh, be sure to self-isolate uh, and uh, stay away from others, particularly those that are vulnerable, until such time that you maybe can confirm that you don't have COVID. As we take a look at risks uh, as a state, uh, you know we're fortunate that <clears throat> that right now. Uh, we've got a uh, some really good numbers we're going to talk about in a second. And I know that there has been theories uh, since the very beginning because other uh, flu-like or uh, viruses often uh, have less impact in the summer, but we also know that while we're seeing some declines in the northeastern part of the United States uh, where we had the most number of cases and the most number of deaths, uh, there is a lot of news from southern states uh, you know, California, Arizona, Texas, Georgia, Florida, North Carolina, others where we have some counties within those uh, that are seeing increases. And again, these are in uh, warm weather areas. Uh, it was shared yesterday that these counties where the growth is occurring, it's about 110 counties out of the over 3,100 counties uh, in uh, the United States. So about 3% of counties uh, are having some increases. Generally, those are counties that are that have higher uh, higher dense uh, populations. We <clears throat> We want to get into the numbers a little bit, and since we uh, had our uh, briefing last Tuesday on June 16th, we're going to show some numbers that reflect the week versus the day. Uh, and during that time, over the course of the last seven days, uh, we confirmed another 198 cases over seven days of COVID-19, uh, but it was out of 22,865 tests that were conducted, and that is a record uh, number of tests in a single week. So again, congratulations to all all the people involved in both collecting and processing those tests. Uh, that brings the positive test rate uh, for the week uh, down to under 1%, uh, which is the lowest we've had in uh, some time. And again, uh, a great uh, milestone for us. The point now is to uh, you know keep it there as opposed to have it uh, climb back up as other we've seen other states where it may have come down and then gone back up again. North Dakota remains well positioned and well prepared. Uh, if we do have a surge because of our uh, testing capability and the low use of hospitalization. Uh, but from a testing standpoint, we've now completed 158,526 tests uh, and we're closing in on 100,000 unique North Dakotans uh, that, we have, that we've tested. Uh, on, in serial testing, which you know, this is the testing where we people get tested uh, repeatedly, particularly in high risk situations like long-term uh, care workers, or other healthcare workers or residents in long-term care. And again, on this slide, the light blue on the top uh, represents the people who had been tested previously at least once and were tested again. The bottom and the gray represents North Dakotans that had not been uh, tested before. So in the past week, 8,765 North Dakotans were newly tested and close to 14,000 uh, individuals had repeats or serial tests. When we take a look at that neck case breakdown uh, with the uh over the uh, uh, last week, we had 198 new cases, as I shared. 288 were newly recovered, which is why our active confirmed cases went down. Uh, and this is the lowest uh, number at 234. Uh, that's down uh, uh, from 330 active cases a week ago, and it's the lowest number of active cases since April 16th, so for in over two months. And when we have fewer number of active cases, even when with record amount of testing and then we know where those actives are because those actives are uh, are uh, isolated uh, then th this is one of the ways that we can contain and slow the spread and help work on our half of what we're doing which is saving the livelihoods which is getting our economy uh, uh, fully rolling again so out of the uh, three thousand and 320 positives, we've seen 3,008 individuals recover, but sadly we've had 78 deaths. This is four up from last uh, week when we were here Tuesday. Uh, last Thursday, uh, there was a, a man in his 60s from uh, Cass County. Uh, Fridays, it was a woman in her 90s from Cass County. Uh, Sunday, a man in his 60s from Stutzman County. And today, uh, there was a uh, 
a woman in her 40s uh, from uh, Cass County. All of those individuals had underlying health conditions. Uh, as was reported earlier this morning, uh, we had a uh, software issue uh, in the uh, electronic lab reporting system, which consolidates uh, a number of the different systems into what the reports where we actually put out the numbers. And so the uh, that uh, initially reported this morning seven positives out of uh, 327 cases. The Recently, the data has been updated uh, as they've worked to complete this. This is there's now 11 positives for today out of nearly 1,300 tests or so. Uh, and again, a little lighter a number of testing today. Uh, these are tests that were processed on Monday, uh, reflecting some of the lighter test collections the day before on Sunday, but that's a 0.85 or less than 9%. So was still a great low number in terms of percent positives. I want to thank the, uh, the staff, uh, the IT staff, and those working at the lab that spotted the software issue late last night. They worked till 4 a.m. to resolve it, and as the system catches up today, uh, the final completed updated numbers will be reported out tomorrow for Monday, along with Tuesday's numbers tomorrow. So we'll have the final final reconciliation and update. Uh, the next topic uh, <clears throat> has to do with uh, contact tracing. And it relates back to testing, because of course, when we have a positive, we like to reach out to those individuals and have a have a, someone with a public health background talk to that individual, and again find out who they might have been in contact with, so we can encourage those individuals to get tested, uh, and again uh, help slow the spread of this contagious virus. Uh, the <clears throat> but again, when we are doing all this testing, uh, some days, as you know, when we've got. Uh, less than 1% positive. We have thousands of people someday to notify that they're negative. And of course, we want to do that with a phone call. We want to do it as quick as we can. This was something that was uh, consuming uh, some of our scarce contact tracing uh, capability uh, was doing the, the follow-up calls for people that were negative, and I want to give a special shout out today as we announce a, a, a great public-private uh, partnership between the state of North Dakota and Blue Cross Blue Shield of North Dakota. They're going to provide call center services in support of our state's uh, contact tracing efforts, so at no cost to the state, Blue Cross Blue Shield is committed to support uh, calling those who have a negative test, and they'll, take, they'll call up to 1,000 individuals per week over the next couple of months. And so far, Blue Cross Blue Shield, North Dakota Customer Service uh, team members, along with other volunteers, have not already notified more than 760 individuals that they had a negative test result. So these are fun calls to make. Uh, and they'll be uh, only contacting individuals with negative COVID-19 test results. And we've got strict security uh, measures in place and protocols to ensure that personal health information remains secure. The contact tracers, which are employed through the state, will continue contacting uh, all of those individuals uh, who get a positive result uh, and the remainder, because on some days we actually have thousands of people to call with, with negatives. But we're grateful for this added capacity by this public-private partnership and we'll continue ex this will continue to expand our ability to get back to people quickly with this important information. So particularly those that get the negatives so they know that they can go on uh, with their family lives and their work lives. Uh, next topic uh, has to do with a, uh, executive order update. Early in our response to COVID-19, I signed Executive Order 2020-07, directing law enforcement and private sector businesses to recognize North Dakota driver's license and motor vehicle registrations that had expired on or after March 1, meaning that once we were uh, in the pandemic, if your license, uh, driver's license or your motor vehicle registration expired, it was still uh, still legal and still effective. Today, I signed Executive Order 2020-36. Uh, this continues to direct all law enforcement in the state and private sector businesses to recognize a North Dakota driver's license and motor vehicle registrations that expired on or after March 1st, uh, that they're to be recognized as legal until August 31st. Uh, this executive order simply adds an end date compared to what we had before, which was open-ended. Uh, 
And it means that on September 1, all North Dakota driver's license and motor vehicle registrations will need to be up to date. Uh, letters have been sent to those customers whose driver's license have expired since March 1 uh, and who have not yet had them had it had those renewed uh, and they are notifying them with letters to, to let them know now to schedule an appointment and currently uh, NDDOT uh, is working to address the backlog of over 20,650 license renewals and over 48,000 motor vehicle registrations all of which expired during the COVID emergency and those are all covered under this executive order but again between those two it's about 70,000 transactions that need to be completed in the next 10 weeks between now and uh and August 31st, in addition to the regular workload, which would be coming in this summer. But so much work has been completed uh, to help uh, help uh, get us in position to close this backlog. And, uh, and team members at NDDOT uh, are working hard, uh, including they're completing driver's tests on Saturdays, uh, scheduling a special driver test day in Jamestown this Thursday, June 25th. They travel to tribal nations to provide photo IDs for voting purposes to meet North Dakotans where they are and to reduce traffic through NDDOT offices. Uh, they're utilizing drop boxes and appointments for vehicle title, title paperwork to reduce traffic through offices and allowing customers to make appointments for motor vehicle business for the first time. And of course, the, with this appointment process, this is an opportunity for us to help uh, streamline and reduce wait times, uh, which is our ultimate goals to provide great service for North Dakota citizens. Uh, just as a separate reminder, if you remember the topic of Real ID, uh, Real ID was the federal law that passed several years ago uh, that, when, that required uh, effectively a, a designation on your state issued driver's license to be a not just effective in the, for state reasons, but also for effective for federal, whether that was entering federal buildings, entering military bases, or flying and getting through a TSA checkpoints uh, that deadline was this fall that was extended earlier during the pandemic by the federal government to October 2021 and so why am I mentioning that now that it's extended October 2021 if you are a North Dakotan and you're renewing your North Dakota driver's license at this time whether it's one that expired uh, after March 1st uh, and is still legal through August 31st or whether it's something that is uh, expiring right now like in July or August uh, if when you come in to do your driver's license renewal, you have an opportunity uh, to obtain a real ID during your scheduled appointment, and this will save you a trip next year, and it'll save um, time and, and energy for both uh, the state and yourself. And so again, uh, go online, understand uh, the real ID requirements in terms of what documentation you need to, to uh, take, and when you, if you come in to do that effort, you can uh, sort of, uh, again, uh, take care of two tasks with one trip by uh, getting your real ID at the time you're renewing your North Dakota license. Uh, at this time, uh, NDDOT is focused on serving customers with driver's license and motor vehicle tabs that expired uh, between March 1 and August 31st, and they'll continue to schedule appointments based on immediate need. Appointments can be made uh, by calling toll-free 1-855-633-6835 or by going online at dot. Gov. And again, some other reminders that DOT has remained open for online and essential services throughout the entire COVID-19 emergency, including infrastructure maintenance, uh, such as road construction. They were doing snow removal uh, in March and doing flood control in April. They expanded online services for driver's license and motor vehicle customers at dot.nd.gov. And as you recall, we talked about those earlier here, but uh, CDL or commercial driver's license renewals were added uh, to the online service to provide better services to the trucking industry uh, as well. Uh, other things that NDDOT and their broad responsibilities uh, to help keep North Dakotans safe both on the road or when they stop. They increased cleaning and sanitation at all DOT facilities, including public rest areas and offices. Uh, they pulled forward and advanced all construction projects scheduled for completion in 2020 uh, in an effort to improve 
complete this important infrastructure, but also to help make sure that our economy keeps uh, growing and going this summer, uh, given all the subcontractors they work with on uh, roads and bridges. Uh, lift, we lifted road restrictions early on state roads and bridges to improve, improve response operations. We launched teleworking for many DOT employees, uh, provided personal and protective gear uh, for as needed, and required contractors to implement new uh, measures to reduce COVID impacts in construction. Uh, and again, the on March 30th, uh, beginning March 30th, we began accepting appointments for a commercial driver's license and H2A written examinations, road tests. Uh, and again, on May 11th, NDT implemented its smart restart effort with prioritized services available by appointment, mail-in, online, and through drop boxes. To give you a, a sense, uh, also, uh, since the North Dakota smart restart was launched just June 11th, uh, so this is just in the last, uh, you know, 12 days, uh, 13,875 driver's test license renewals or duplicate licenses, uh, 127,567 motor vehicle transactions, uh, 79,563 phone calls for services, and 4171 emails requesting appointments. And so again, uh, appreciate uh, the to our citizens uh, and our communities and our employers, thanks for your patience patience and understanding during the support during this unprecedented time. I hope by sharing some of these numbers, you can see the volumes uh, that they were, uh, that the team has been dealing with. Uh, many driver's license services, such as change of address, renewals, replacements, and more, uh, continue to be available online. So first place to check is online at dot.nd.gov. See if you can take care of your transaction there. Uh, motor vehicle services, such as license plates and titling, can also be done uh, by mail in your paperwork. So again, you don't even have to leave your home. Vehicle renewals can be done online or at a, or at a self-service kiosk, or they can be done by mail. So again, if you need to renew your, your, uh, your license tabs, you can do that without having to come in or schedule an appointment. Uh, and lastly, I'd like to say thank you to our dedicated NDDOT team members for their hard work through COVID-19 as they continue delivering essential services, and even more importantly, as they rapidly adapt to serving uh, North Dakota in new ways, including lots of ways uh, that allow you to get your transactions done without having to come physically uh, to a state location. And we know given the, the rural nature and the distributed nature of where our people live across the state, this is a, be a great step forward, which we'll continue to, uh, continue to move on. Uh, next up, next topic I wanna to talk about is the uh, <clears throat> North Dakota National Guard. I think everyone knows that the North Dakota National Guard has played a critical role in the COVID-19 response for from absolutely the very moment that it began, uh, which is the case in just about every single emergency the state faces, that our guard is there uh, and ready to go. Guard members have served in a variety of mission cr critical capac capacities, and it's on everything from distributing PPE to, to gathering data, to working in the lab, transporting test samples, uh, and and helping with all of our the testing we've done around the state. <clears throat> We're incredibly grateful to the these service-minded men and women who in many cases have put their personal lives on hold, uh, their personal careers uh, as they were called up from the private sector to come back and be on active duty during this time and want to thank them for everything they've done to support their communities in our state and also want to thank all of their family members who support them because when one individual serves in the family, uh, the whole family is serving, of course. Um, I want to say again, we would not uh, be where we are today. Uh, we would not have risen to be among the top states in the nation in our pandemic response without the incredible team members at the North Dakota National Guard. Uh, and they're under great leadership, of course, and today uh, General Dorman uh, is joining us to speak more about the significant impact of all of the, the, the Guard team across North Dakota throughout this ongoing COVID response. And again, I wanna share with General Dorman uh, my deep gratitude for his leadership, not only of the North Dakota National Guard, but also of his leadership uh, of the North Dakota Emergency Serv Department of Emergency Services, which reports up to him, and also his co-leading of the Unified Command since we began this. So again, General Dorman, thank you for being here and thanks to all the great team members at North Dakota National Guard. Well, thank you, Governor, uh, and thank you for 
Uh, your leadership on behalf of the 4100 uh, Army and Air Guardsmen, uh, we truly appreciate your leadership, not only as governor, but as commander in chief of the National Guard. Uh, I also appreciate the opportunity to talk uh, about uh, some of my favorite people in the world, and that's the men and women that raise their right hand, take an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States of America and the Constitution of North Dakota. Uh, and these are, as I'll touch on later, I want to share some of their stories, not mine. Uh, nobody graduates from high school and says, I want to be an adjutant general someday. Uh, but when they hear uh, what some of our soldiers and airmen do, uh, it might strike a chord with them uh, in, in ways that they can serve uh, their community, their state, and their nation. Uh, the governor touched on the National Guard. One of our mottos is always ready, always there. And whether it's floods, fires, uh, storms, and now pandemics, uh, I think the National Guard has once again shown that we are always ready, always there. Uh, we started early on, almost from the beginning. Uh, initially, uh, we brought in a lot of guardsmen uh, to help with things like planning, uh, emergency operations, uh, personnel, our joint information service to help get information out to the media and our, our citizens, um, and planning teams. Um, the military is accused of over planning sometimes, but we have a lot of folks uh, that have a lot of training and planning. Uh, we have a lot of folks with a lot of training and gathering information and making it into useful information, not just the news. Uh, that came out wrong. Um, <laughs> but but uh, actionable information is what I meant to say. Um, and, and these are all military acquired skills that we can quickly use to respond in a domestic situation. Uh, and I'm always in awe of the level of expertise and capability, curiosity, adaptability uh, that our members have. And, and some of our members I met for the first time in this pandemic and I didn't realize that we had wicked smart math guys uh, that could do modeling. Uh, that could do other things that I didn't even know existed before the pandemic. Uh, but it is really incredible. And like I said, we're on board almost from the outset uh, to today where we have about 312 guardsmen on um, supporting a variety of missions. Um, I want to talk a little bit about our CST. We'll talk about the numbers too. Uh, but our CST is our civil support team. Uh, you've probably seen them in action before. It's a full-time National Guard capability. It's 22 individuals. Uh, we have science officers. We have physician assistants. Uh, we have guys in moon suits that can go out and take a sample of something you're not sure of what it is. And we have mobile labs that we can then analyze that. And this is all in support of civil authorities in the state of North Dakota. But early on, we know we needed to get um, some some of the right people with the right skills engaged right away. And our civil support team were one of the first on the mission. Our civil support team, uh, I would say, literally wrote the book on drive-through testing. And, and not just for North Dakota. There's a lot of other states that have contacted us to say, all right, how are you doing that? And to give you some idea of, of their effort, uh, if you remember way back when we were in Amadon, that seems like a lifetime ago, but we did drive-through testing in Amadon. Um, and those guys planned, uh, they resourced it, they executed it, and we were so proud uh, that we got 80 people through a five-lane drive-through testing per hour. Um, but because of their curiosity, their desire to always get better, their desire to accomplish the mission. We improved on that, and the next day in Gladstone, we were faster. And we've gone from 80 per hour in Amidon to the drive-through testing we did in Bismarck last week. On a five-lane drive-through testing event, we could do 200 an hour. And with some of the work we've done with the Department of Health and the lead and the support of NDIT, uh, we continue to work on uh, IT solutions to make that an even quicker. But just gives you an idea of the, the quality of the members of the National Guard, and it's always about getting the mission done. And anything we can do to improve the mission to better serve our citizens, uh, that is something the team is going to get after. The other thing is initiative too. If anybody was at the drive through testing in Bismarck, uh, you know that we pretty much clogged up 4th Street for a long time. Um, 
And, and I mentioned this with the governor one day, it didn't take me or the governor saying, hey, can we generate some options here? This, there's a lot of people that want to test. Um, but a young lieutenant saw this backup and he knew he had a team that was set to go to Jamestown the next day, preparing to go do that mission. And uh, he coordinated with his boss and said, hey, I could deploy my team right now to the Capitol, set up five more lanes and we can go from, or four more lanes, we can go from three lanes to seven lanes and work off this backlog. And they did that on their own. Nobody had to tell them to do it. They just saw a problem. They had a solution. They generated options and they got it in place. So uh, again, just a testament to the, the quality of uh, the men and women of the North Dakota National Guard. Uh, the CST was also instrumental in uh, helping the lab uh, go from 200 tests a day to thousands of tests a day, uh, from setting up the mobile labs, which we've discussed before, our mobile like a mobile home, not like an RV, uh, but they set up the mobile labs, uh, they got the equipment, help with, uh, under Dr. Mason's leadership at the state lab, uh, help get all that set up, um, got seven new pieces of equipment online and operating. At the peak, we had 45 guardsmen uh, that were working at the lab to help us uh, surge from a couple hundred tests a day to several thousand tests a day. And, and interestingly uh, enough, or interesting, I can't say that word obviously, but um, a lot of those guardsmen when they came off orders came on as temporary state employees with the Department of Health. Again, because they know they were making a difference, uh, helping that lab get up to the capacity it is, and these are people that are internally wired to serve others and make a difference. And again, just a testament uh, to who these uh, great men and women are in the North Dakota National Guard. Uh, the governor already mentioned, uh, in addition to the civil support team, uh, we've had a lot of folks that have put their civilian lives on hold uh, to stand up two more mobile testing teams. Um, and we've done a number of missions. Um, uh, you know, all total, we've had 547 guardsmen uh, on duty during the pandemic, uh, 49 different mission sets, uh, 248 mobile testing events, uh, 350 courier events, and I'm not good at math, but I took those numbers and looked at the total tests administered in the state of North Dakota. And whether it was testing them or currying the tests back to the state lab, a guardsman touched 47% of those tests. And when you look at the level of support in the lab, it might be close to 100% of those tests. Uh, might have had the National Guard involved. In all total, uh, since the start of the pandemic, uh, almost 20,000 total personnel days of National Guard support to the pandemic response. Um, and then uh, the next slide just talks about all the different missions uh, we've performed, uh, deep cleaning and long-term care, uh, working on the testing strategy. You were introduced to Brigadier General Schulte a while back. He was spearheading that uh, for a number of weeks. Uh, the modeling efforts, I already told you about our wicked smart math guy that helped uh, the Department of Health with their modeling efforts. Uh, Long-term care, uh, just across the board. Our job is to support others, the lead agency, the Department of Health, incident commanders at the local level. Um, and we're, again, extremely, I'm extremely proud and humbled uh, to be part of this. Uh, I'd really, I'd like to end um, with other people's words. Because uh, again, nobody graduates high school and says that, that adjutant general job looks really cool. I think I'd like to do that someday. Uh, but some of what our soldiers and airmen do uh, is pretty cool. And I just want to close with a few quotes here. Um, I feel very lucky to support my home and surrounding community during the response to COVID-19. I've learned so many new things about my profession, about myself and fellow North Dakotans that I wouldn't have otherwise. I feel incredibly fortunate to be making a difference. Private First Class Leah Thompson from the 141st Maneuver Enhancement Brigade. Next one. This is literally what I signed up for. Well, almost. No one could have predicted a worldwide pan pandemic, but my call to serve came from a personal commitment and sense of duty to help protect the people in North Dakota. And I've been doing a minuscule part of that every day. I am humbled. Sergeant First Class Jeremy Siegel from the 81st CST. Next quote. If you told me this is what I'd be doing on my 21st birthday, 
I tell you, I wasn't, I wasn't fighting pandemics on my 21st birthday, but uh, if you told me this is what I'd be doing on my 21st birthday, I probably wouldn't have ever believed you, but it makes me feel incredibly proud to be here now. The well-being of the state and the health of North Dakotans is uh, way more important and meaningful. I will remember and cherish this birthday forever. Specialist Logan Bauer of the 816th Military Police. And finally, these rolling hills and smiling faces are my home. I joined the North Dakota National Guard primarily because I wanted to give back to a community that has given so much to me. Though the circumstances may be unfortunate, I am proud to say that I've gotten that opportunity during the response to COVID-19. That was from Staff Sergeant Brian Olson. So those are some of the folks that are serving in your North Dakota National Guard. Um, the other reason I'm here today is to tell you that there are more opportunities for young people to serve in the North Dakota National Guard. Uh, we had a teleconference um, a couple weeks ago at the national level because the Army is way behind its recruiting efforts since the pandemic started. Um, I'm pleased to say that in the North Dakota National Guard, we've had our best recruiting uh, from March to the end of June of 2020 um, as we've had in the same time period for the previous six years. And I think a big reason is uh, the quality of our, our people, uh, the culture of our organization, and the opportunity uh, to be part of something bigger than yourself and to give back to your community. And uh, our citizens see that every time we call out the National Guard in North Dakota. Um, so um, I'm just in incredibly proud again and humbled. Um, when you have record recruiting, when everybody else um, is having difficulty recruiting, um, that speaks volumes about who we are as North Dakotans. Uh, in the North Dakota National Guard. So for your benefit, so you can pursue these opportunities, uh, I just put the numbers up there uh, for our recruiters. And if there's anyone uh, interested, please reach out. Um, I did the math the other day, and even with record recruiting, uh, we could uh, bring in another about 180 young men and women uh, who want to be part of the North Dakota National Guard. And you don't even have to be from North Dakota. So if you're listening in Minnesota, give us a call. So with that, thank you very much, Governor. Is that you? Okay. Thank you, General Dorman. And I wanna reiterate that last point again. Uh, <clears throat> on the guard recruiting, because again, having an opportunity, it's an honor to uh, to work with and have gotten to know a uh, number of the folks in the North Dakota National Guard, and I know from their experiences that they, uh, they not only learn important uh, life skills that can help them in the private sector, they make lifelong friends, and as you heard from the quotes, uh, they have an opportunity to do some really purpose-filled service work right here in North Dakota. So thank you to all the members of the North Dakota National Guard and their families for helping us get through this, and uh, we, we still need you. You're an important role going through this going forward. So again, thanks for, for what you're doing every day and continue to do as we uh, work through this. Uh, <clears throat> next uh, update is on uh, long-term care. Uh, and uh, we have... Uh, some great progress there. So again, I want to give some shout outs there uh, to the uh, long-term care facilities. We issued guidelines uh, with multiple f two phases, two gating phases to go through. Uh, we have 212 of the eligible 218 facilities. That includes every assisted living, every basic care, and every skilled nursing facility in the state. 212 of the 218 have, have completed and entered into phase one, uh, which means that uh, for, their, for their own uh, internal operations, they can uh, reinstitute uh, communal or group uh, dining with appropriate uh, you know, hygiene and spacing, uh, and they can uh, also resume internal activities, uh, that, that recreational activities such as bingo or other uh, activities that may go on. There's only three facilities uh, left uh, to enter into phase one uh, for the uh, reopening. Uh, and. Uh, 
two of those have, have yet to meet the gating criteria. Uh, the other one is waiting for their testing results. And of course, at all 218 facilities, outdoor visitation has been allowed all along and continues to be allowed all, you know, continues to be allowed. And, and again, uh, thank you for those folks that are, they're doing outdoor visitation. We have heard some feedback on outdoor visitation that it's in some larger facilities, it's taking um, a long time to make an appointment because the demand is high. And again, uh, with the guidelines we've given, we want to encourage uh, facilities to do what they can to accommodate the needs of family members. And whether that's setting up uh, multiple places outside where uh, visitation can occur or figuring out your staffing requirements. So visitation can occur not just nine to five Monday through Friday, but evenings and weekends uh, when family members might be more available. Uh, again, uh, family members, if you're, if you're running into challenges uh, doing outdoor visitation, uh, first step is contact the facility. Uh, second step uh, after that is to uh, contact uh, North Dakota Department of Human Services. We've got a series of ombudsmen uh, that are available to help uh, facilitate you and help you as a family member understand uh, the guidelines that we've issued uh, to help you uh, in your discussions or negotiations with the facilities where your family members may, may be living. And of course, if you need to uh, have your family member uh, leave for an important event, a wedding or something like this, uh, that has also always been allowed. Uh, people are eligible to leave these facilities. There may be facility rules that apply uh, <clears throat> when they uh, return in terms of isolation or when they need to get tested again. Uh, but again, you can uh, work that out with your facility and we're happy to, happy to help. Phase two, uh, 35 facilities have already entered into phase two, which means, uh, and again, we've completed the second round of testing and they've got no uh, COVID cases among residents. Uh, at phase two, that's when uh, indoor uh, visitation can occur. So indoor visitation is restarted at 35 facilities in North Dakota. And again, uh, those are among the first in the nation where indoor visitation is, is uh, reopening up. So congratulations to those organizations. Uh, <clears throat> again, as we said, family members, if you're going to visit, uh, good idea to know your status. Uh, so again, if you're, uh, young and healthy. Uh, there's still a possibility that you're, that you are young and healthy may, uh, may be an asymptomatic COVID. So again, if you have an opportunity to get tested and know your own status, that's great. If you do go visit, you know, please follow the guidelines from the facility that may include masks and distancing to make sure that we're not re-entering uh, or that we reintroduce uh, the deadly COVID virus into any facility because, again, as you're seeing your loved one, we don't want to put anyone in that facility at risk. Uh, we have a, <clears throat> a pilot project, which we announced last week, giving an update on that at Augusta Place in Bismarck because one of the ways that we we want to continue to uh, <clears throat> build uh, build skill and knowledge is how to, to, uh, to avoid the gates would be to have family members tested the same way we're testing long-term care health workers. So on Friday, 51 family members of residents at Augusta Place were tested for COVID-19. That represented about 50% of the families of the residents. As a part of this pilot project, uh, those who had a uh, negative test uh, would be allowed uh, to visit their loved one. And yesterday, Monday, was the first day of visitation. And so 10 family members were able to visit their loved ones. Today, there's 12 family members. And Augusta Place is still on track to go into phase two later this week. This would allow for visitation inside the facility for all residents uh, <clears throat> without the required COVID testing of the visitor. But again, uh, we appreciate Augusta Place being part of that pilot project because this could be one way where uh, if we end up uh again, might be a skill that we need going forward uh, to be able to ensure visitation and protect uh, those residents. Uh, we'll continue to work closely as we have with the North Dakota Long-Term Care Association, with long-term care facilities, uh, and the resident uh, council uh, on reuniting residents and families in a safe and timely manner. Uh, we know that this is uh, deeply important uh, to maintain uh, those connections because this is important to maintain uh, the mental health as well as the physical health. And so again, uh, thanks to all those long-term care facilities and congrats to those that are the 35 that have already completed and are into phase two. Next topic is the uh, back on the census topic. <clears throat> 
This is a very important one. We've talked about it multiple times, uh, and we've made a little uh, progress, but not the kind of progress we we need to see. And this is important for everyone to understand what this could mean. Uh, the census determines all kinds of things on federal funding, not just next year, but for the next decade. Each resident uh, that is missed in the counting uh, could come at a loss of $19,000 to the state of North Dakota. And this is for highway construction, school lunch programs, special education grants, housing assistance and so much more. So many of the federal programs uh, that touch all of the lives of people in North Dakota are, are based on our population as a small population state. It's been more critical than ever that everybody counts. And as we say, you count. So make sure that you get uh, counted. Um, the, there's a portion of emergency funding that North Dakota receives uh, during this pandemic, for example, that is a result of a census taken uh, 10 years ago. And again, we know that that uh, we're, we're undercounting in that sense because our state is much larger than it was 10 years ago. So all the more important for the next decade that people get counted. As of Thursday, uh, June 18th, 61.3% uh, of North Dakota households had responded, and that's uh, unfortunately slightly less than the national average of 61.5%. Uh, uh, the Census Bureau would have sent to you completed delivery of forms to all households in the state. Uh, those that had PO boxes were uh, delayed due to COVID until mid-May or early June uh, to the requirement uh, for to hand deliver to the residents. I mean, so again, it would not have come to your PO box. They would have delivered it to your physical location. Uh, but th what this means is we've got nearly 40% of the households in North Dakota have not yet responded. Uh, of the 50 states, we're right in the middle of the pack. It's not a place we want to be. We're 20 fifth, uh, but uh, we're behind uh, Minnesota, uh, which has got, uh, is in first place with 71.1% of people responding. South Dakota slightly ahead of us at 62.2, and uh, but we do remain ahead of Montana. Let's uh, keep it that way. Uh, but we should have you also say, again, uh, just like with federal taxes, uh, this is a uh, this is a non-optional. You may say, gee, I don't feel like filling this thing out because I don't want to share any information with the government. Uh, remember that any information shared with the Census Bureau does not go to any other uh, part of the government. But starting in August, if they haven't heard from you, the Census Bureau will send employees door to door to those households which have not yet responded. And if they can't catch you at home, they'll go to a neighbor and ask about your household. And this is all on federal law. So if you would like to have people not come to your door, uh, then there you have an opportunity to go online to my2020census.gov. Uh, it can take a uh, less than 10 minutes, some people can get done at five, uh, five minutes. If you don't have access to the internet, if you have access to a phone, you can respond by phone at 844-330-2020. Uh, or if you've got a paper form laying around, uh, pull that out and fill it out and send it in. The uh, Your self-response benefits our communities. Households that self-respond tend to be more accurate than those that wait for the Census Bureau to come to the door and this prevents the undercounting and the loss of finances. And again, of more than 19,000 cities in the United States. North River, North Dakota remains the only community to have reached 100%. Uh, and while our statewide average is in the middle of the pack where the state is 25th, we got five communities in the top 25 cities nationwide. Uh, as again, North River number one. Frontier uh, is in 15th place at 89.9. Harwood at 89.3. Argusville, uh, one of our old arch rivals from Arthur, uh, 88.9. Way to go, Argusville. And then Riley's Acres, 88.7. Those are all Fargo metro area uh, communities that are in five in the top 25 cities in the United States out of 1,900. Uh, let's follow their lead uh, and move North Dakota uh, up the leaderboard on the census count. We will applaud all the local complete count committees who are working hard. There's obviously a great complete count committee up there in the uh, uh, north and east of, of the Fargo metro area doing that nation leading work, but again, uh, mycensus2020.gov to respond or by phone on the phone number listed there, but thank you for getting that done. Uh, behavioral health update is the next topic. <clears throat> Disasters, which are <clears throat> can be both human or 
nature or caused by nature affect people and community in different ways and as a community or an individual begins to rebuild and recover it's very common for disaster survivors to have reactions to their experiences survivors may show physical or emotional signs of stress after the fact they may be affected financially sadness grief and anger are just some of the common emotions that survivors may experience and reaction to the disaster may occur not only in the people with direct experience but also those who are indirect directly affected through repeated exposure to media coverage of the incident. Uh, with good news is that survivors are resilient, often recover with no additional assistance. However, some people may need a little extra help in the recovery process. And so again, please don't hesitate to reach out uh, for help or to assist a loved one in finding additional support. Uh, one of the things that the First Lady uh, and myself, again, want to continue to keep champion is uh, to remove the uh, shame and stigma of the disease of addiction. But in the same way, we want to remove the shame and stigma associated with mental or behavioral health because health means both uh, mental health and behavioral health, not just physical health. And... Uh, and issues related such as stress or uh, sort of a post-disaster uh, stress condition could uh, again have real effects on your physical health and so again don't be afraid to reach out for help uh, if you we again all of us have gone through uh, a rather traumatic experience uh, whether it's the experience with the pandemic or the financial crisis that accompanied it but uh, pro project renew.nd.gov uh, is up and running uh, through this special uh, grant that the state of North Dakota received. Again, this free and confidential crisis counseling uh, are available. Projectrenew.nd.gov or call 701-223-1510 or you just go to the website. If you go out there and you can see examples and of emotional, behavioral, physical, and cognitive responses that are common reactions. So if you're feeling uh, stressed or a little out of sorts after coming to this, uh, that might be completely normal. And knowing what to expect in your personal life, your family life, your work your financial life uh, may help you uh, be a better a better parent a better spouse a better friend a better neighbor uh, as you work through your own response and recovery uh, and again projectrenew.nd.gov and thank you to our great behavioral health team uh, in in North Dakota uh, for, which is uh, providing these daily updates uh, next we have an announcement uh, as you know uh, each of the last three summers we've held an innovative education summit uh, and this year will be uh the same, and it's the fourth annual summit. It'll take place on Tuesday, July 21st. This one will be different because it's going to be virtual. Uh, and again, so we've got a new date. If we can pop that one up on the slide, uh, the uh, North Dakota schools experienced uh, disruption to face-to-face -face learning. Uh, but I know that uh, teachers and school districts uh, and uh, educators across our state are responding by embracing this opportunity to improve educational delivery delivery and learning experiences. We have learned uh, so much in the months this spring about what works and what doesn't work uh, when we're doing distance learning. Uh, and again, as we strive to get everybody back into school next fall, we don't know what the pandemic may hold ahead of us. And so again, as we continue to want to build out the capability uh, to deliver uh, blended learning or distance learning if need be, and if not statewide by a facility, if there's a, a, a outbreak at a facility and kids have to be sent home. Uh, we've got more skills that we need to continue uh, to develop. This year's summit will be a live stream event uh, and it's uh, going to be available uh, to, for registration. Reserve your spot now at, at this is a long one, 2020 Innovative Education Summit dot eventbrite.com uh, Again, 2020 Innovative Education Summit dot eventbrite.com Summit will bring together stakeholders across the educational system in North Dakota, including parents, students, social workers, uh, behavioral health professionals, teachers, paraprofessionals, business leaders, city officials, professional support staff, and more. Uh, it'll include inspiring messages from game-changing local and national leaders in education, uh, in North Dakota-led sessions and conversations about a safe restart to school. And we encourage all stakeholders to join us for the statewide virtual summit and join in, a collection, and join in the collective cause to ad adopt our education system to the rapidly evolving world. So whether you're an educational professional uh, helping to shape young minds, a student, if you're a student that's just seeking knowledge or a parent wanting the best for your children or a business leader that's invested in the future workforce, we all have an interest in the future of education 
in, uh, in North Dakota an opportunity for us to learn and drive positive change together. It'll be more easier than ever to attend. You don't have to drive. You don't have to uh, be at a physical conference. You'll get a chance to uh, just tap in virtually. And uh, we look forward to sharing additional information as the content and keynote lineup is secured. And we invite North Dakotans to secure the date to participate. But we know that, uh, again, in this virtual world, and we're going to have an opportunity to secure some great content and some great speakers. So please join us at this virtual event, uh, again, at 2020 Innovative Education Summit.eventbrite.com. Uh, we got a good news section. Uh, we uh, know that uh, as 4th of July approaching quickly, we know there are many North Dakotans hoping to finalize their plans for the holiday, and many of those plans often include uh, getting out to one of North Dakota's great state parks. Today, the North Dakota Parks and Recreation announced uh, the group camping sites have reopened across all North Dakota state parks as part of a continued reopening uh, that will also include shelters and rental facilities. Across our 13 uh, state parks, 10 of the state parks have group sites. There's 140 group sites uh, at those uh, state parks. Uh, and again, if you want to uh, find out more information or make a reservation about capacity limits and further details, there's a Parks and Rec reservation site, which is travel.com parkrecnd.com, that is definitely .com, check that before this meeting, not .gov. So parks, the Parks and Rec takes you directly there, travel.parkrecnd. Dot com. Uh, the beginning this week, uh, the Bismarck office is going to be open again for but by appointment to purchase park passes. We encourage you to make an appointment by calling 701-328-5357. Uh, visitors will be asked uh, the North Dakota Smart Restart screening questions before entering the building. Uh, but again, if you want to call ahead and get a pass, if you don't, uh, you can purchase park passes online, which is a even a better way to go, which is make and make those reservations by visiting parkrec.nd.gov. We recommend going online first. You can also make reservations online. And of course, you can also drive to a state park and buy a, a pass at the gate entrance, but sometimes there's, on busy weekends, there's a line, and that's why it's a good idea to buy it ahead of time uh, online. Uh, In-person off-highway vehicle safety classes will resume uh, in July, and they'll be conducted under the North Dakota Smart Restart Guidelines, course information, and registration for forms for the uh, for an in-person physical off-highway vehicle safety classes at also at parkrecnd.gov. Uh, but again, thanks to everybody at the North Dakota Parks and Rec who work in our parks for getting the parks open for camping earlier this spring and now open for group camping. Uh, hope to see all of you out there enjoying North Dakota's great outdoors. We've got a, a under uh, <clears throat> gratitude, we've got two items. Uh, and the first is one I mentioned last week uh, when we talked about Silver Linings Day. Uh, today is Silver Linings Day, June 23rd. The proclamation we signed earlier recognizes uh, today as Silver Linings Day, the 16,000 individuals who work in long-term care facilities across North Dakota taking care of nearly 10,000 North Dakotans who call these facilities home. Uh, Join us today in thanking uh, these individuals and in the communities in the state which are house these facilities. Uh, we want to say thank you. Thank you for your care and compassion uh, that you share with, with our parents, our grandparents, our family members and friends. Uh, your efforts every day uh, through the COVID-19 emergency earn our deepest gratitude and appreciation because not only were you uh, providing them care, uh, you were there for them, uh, someone who was able to uh, talk to them and be with them during this time. So you've played an even more important role than ever. You've answered a calling to care for some of the most vulnerable among, among us. And we know that that can be difficult at regular times. And now you've had to do it with the additional uh, threat of a deadly uh, virus within those facilities. And as fellow North Dakotans, we thank you for your professionalism, for your patience with our residents and family members. And thanks for your commitment to the whole health of North Dakotans in your charge. Uh, we also want to thank you to our, the residents and the 
family members and friends uh, who stayed in connection with their families electronically during this time and who are re-engaging them now with visitation. We appreciate your patience and understanding and your personal responsibility uh, because North Dakota has had a great track record in keeping uh, COVID-19 uh, largely out of our long-term care facilities uh, relative to other states. And again, that was one of our important goals at the beginning. So let's keep it up as we begin the revisitation. Uh, and then on the last uh, gratitude uh, item, uh, more of a personal one, but certainly it, as it touches the whole state. But uh, as we know from yesterday and on the front page of the Bismarck Tribune today that we lost an exceptional North Dakotan, uh, Sister Thomas Welder. And while we may have lost her here, we know uh, where she has gone uh, to a, a a positive spot where I know that she was well received. Uh, Sister Thomas uh, was the president of the University of Mary for 31 years at the time. That may have been a record in the country for tenure of a university president. She guided that university through through uh, incredible growth uh, academically and athletically and spiritually. Uh, she was the most deservingly the 33rd recipient of the Theodore Roosevelt Rough Rider Award, the highest award the state offers to citizens for her incredible contribution contributions to, to, to the university and to her own compassion and servant leadership. North Dakota is so fortunate to have known this uh, Linton-born uh, individual who, and every, all of us who had a chance to, to spend time with her, uh, her wisdom will continue to guide us and her legacy will live on, on through us. And as I uh, said yesterday in a statement, I was so fortunate because I had an opportunity in the late 80s and early 90s to work directly with Sister Thomas on the Vision 2000 statewide economic development uh, efforts. And I witnessed firsthand the tremendous power in her quiet and humble and grace-filled leadership style. Uh, she embodied all the Rough Rider qualities of reflecting credit and honor upon the state and its citizen. And uh, North Dakota is in a measurably better place because of her extraordinary service and leadership. And uh, she leaves behind an amazing legacy. You know, she spread the light of knowledge and of faith across our state, our nation, and our world. And Catherine and I extend our deepest condolences and heartfelt prayers to the, all the Benedictine sisters and to her family and her friends and the entire you know, University of Mary uh, community. But what an incredible life. And I know that she'll be honored uh, well uh, in the days ahead and remembered forever, including with her portrait right outside this room in the hallway in, uh, with the Rough Rider Hall of Fame. So again, uh, Sister Thomas, again, thank you for everything you did for the state of North Dakota. Uh, it ties right in with our gratitude quote. Dr. Albert Schweitzer said, sometimes our light goes out, but is blown again into instant flame by an encounter with another human being. Each of us owes deepest thanks to those who have rekindled this inner light. I'm sure there are literally thousands of students and individuals and business leaders and people who worked at the University of Mary and family members who, when you had contact with Sister Thomas, uh, she blew your light into an instant flame uh, because you could just feel her grace when you're in her presence. And so again, uh, for that, the quote from Dr. Schweitzer, so fitting for Sister Thomas Welder. Uh, with that, uh, we say uh, 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 thank you. And uh, our next event is gonna be TBD, but we're thinking about it being Wednesday, July 8th at 3.30 p.m. Uh, and so until that time, uh, North Dakota, uh, stay North Dakota smart and stay North Dakota healthy. And with that, we'll stand for questions. I'm gonna go online first, since it's, <clears throat> I think they were waving their hand wildly online. I just couldn't, couldn't see them. Mike Smith, 660KYZ in Williston. When the pandemic began in March, North Dakota was one of the last states to be impacted. I believe you had said there were, that we were a few weeks behind other states. With the rising uptick in a number of other states, are you worried North Dakota could see a dramatic rise in cases soon? A good question, but answer is no. I feel like that all the, with the increased testing uh, simultaneous with our, with our lower 
percent positives, uh, I feel like we're in good shape. I think we have to do continue to stay, uh, uh, you know, vigilant through the summer because as we have more activities, uh, more people getting together, more weddings, more. Uh, people in, in congregant settings, more people getting back and going out to dinner. We, we do have to pay attention because there is a correlation between uh, transmissible moments and the, and the rate of transmission. So we, got it. we have to pay, continue to pay attention, uh, but, but I feel that we're in very good position right now. Uh, I think when we see other states with rising numbers, we have to again be careful. There's a lot of headlines about numbers going up and absolute numbers. Those absolute numbers go up. Uh, in some cases because there's more testing being done. Uh, and so you really have to focus in on that just 110 counties uh, that are seeing an increase in their positivity rate. But as we experienced here, when we got better at, at contact tracing, our positivity rate went up because we were testing the people who were in close contact with positives because we were trying to get the positive, we were trying to find the positives and get them isolated. So uh, I, I'm, uh, I think the answer to the question for Mike is no, not. Not worried, but we're, we're cautious, cautiously optimistic, and uh, continuing to pay close attention every day to the numbers. Okay, I'm gonna go uh, Jacob, then Jeremy. Uh, going off of that, Governor, uh, the President said at his rally that he wants to bring testing down. Dr. Fauci and other uh, health officials say they should keep testing up. I'm not going to ask you if your data-driven decisions decide whether or not you want to have more testing, but is this divide at the federal level going to affect resource allocation to the state level? Uh, the answer is no. Uh, we had... Uh, you know, a call yesterday with, as I said at the outset, uh, with Vice President Pence, uh, Dr. Burks, uh, you know, Polochek, Girard, Azar, Seema Verma, the whole team there. Uh, any governor that said, we need more swabs, like the governor of Maine, okay, we're gonna get you more swabs. We need more tests, we'll get you more tests. I mean, which has been the same with every call. So the, the national stockpiles and the caches now uh, are, you know, the goal is to get to 60 to 90 days worth of PPE and capability in every state. And I, I uh, ex you know, everything that we've heard, everything that we've seen is consistent with the idea that we need to test. And I think Dr. Brooks in particular was very articulate about uh, as, as we head into this, these summer months, it's really important that we're testing uh, younger people who are either asymptomatic, meaning no symptoms, or mildly symptomatic, uh, because those could become the super spreaders unknowingly. Uh, and, and so that's why, again, testing, is a, testing remains a very key, uh, a key part of this. Jeremy and then Dave. Uh, you, you've mentioned in the past that you'd like all the school children in the state to be able to go back in the fall. I'm wondering when your office has a plan to release some of those guidelines for returning students. Well, we are uh, obviously plenty of discussions going on uh, through you know DPI, and, and uh, this week we've got a, I think actually. Uh, on Thursday, we've got a K-12 coordinating council, uh, which again is a you know newly constituted uh, group that the legislature wisely put together that brings together uh, the educational uh, leaders, the uh, the teachers union, the uh, the teachers, uh, the DPI, the governor's office, I mean, brings all the stakeholders together into one formal group. And when I say that, that seems like in North Dakota, it's like, well, gee, that's just like a normal thing. Many states, those groups never get in the same room ever. Uh, now we, we, we meet regularly. Uh, we've got uh, resources in terms of, of uh, support to help us drive agendas and drive dialogue going forward. And so uh, when that group was created, nobody saw the pandemic coming. But that group is going to be super helpful in helping to uh, pull together all the various stakeholders as we help develop a plan. Uh, the other thing we're also watching very closely through uh, the different governors associations is, you know, all the states are working on different plans right now, uh, you know, based on their own based on their own situations that they have. But there is a lot of people nationally working on the how do we safely get school kids back into school, and so there's uh, and and we've got some time between now and August to do that so compared to some of the other fire drills we've been running through this one uh, this is it's a it's a big complex 
operation, as we talked about, I mean, it's an, you know, $8 million plus a day operation in North Dakota to be, you know, busing and feeding and, uh, and helping to educate 120,000 school kids. Uh, and, and so it's a, it's, there's, there's enormous complexity uh, with a lot of local control because you got all the school boards, uh, which again, school board association also represented on the coordinating council. Uh, those are, it's a challenging thing, but I, I'm confident that by July we'll have uh, things uh, surfacing and I would think the direction will be a combination of, of uh, as it was this spring uh, when we were uh, working through the pandemic, it was a set of state guidelines, uh, you know, augmented in some cases by local control, like we did with graduation. So I think we've got a good working relationship. We have a good framework, uh, and we'll, uh, you know, look look forward uh, to doing that. But again, testing needs to be a part of that. Uh, and one of the other things that's really open ended is is how do we make sure that we protect? Because there are vulnerable students. There are students that have got. Uh, you know, they may have been treated for cancer, they may have an immune deficiency, and we've got, you know, teachers and staff and cooks and bus drivers that might also fall into this category. So, so it's not, um, it's not, you know, hey, let's just throw a bunch of healthy kids and, and do herd immunity. We've got, a, there's, there's a real consideration of the vulnerable population that exists. And even if that's only a small percentage, we've got to really be thoughtful about it. And look, and at the same time, we've also got to figure out a way in this context, because everything I've just answered your question is about health. So we have to do health, but at the same time, we also have to figure out how do we do education better? I mean, because our educational system can and needs to be even better and stronger than it is. And we had, a, you know, again, like we had a great strat review yesterday with the, uh, the distance education and the, um, and I say strat review, I mean, as part of our regular ongoing government getting ready for business, we've restarted all of our strategy reviews and so we're meeting with the Center for Distance Education and the uh, uh, Career and Technical Education. And there's so many new opportunities to expand career and technical education, uh, again, beyond the physical buildings and do some of that online. So again, we, we, this is an opportunity for us to not just rethink, there's a bigger, it's, yes, we need to figure out how to get kids and teachers and staff back into buildings in a safe and healthy way, but we also have to figure out how do we do education better than we've ever done before. And our administration uh, wants to push hard on both of those fronts. The first one's a prerequisite, but the second one, there's an opportunity here in this thing to really focus on how do we move ahead in education compared to other states. We, I, I've said before, we have a chance to have the best education system in the country, and boy, now would be the time to figure out how to get that done. <clears throat> okay, we're going to Dave and then to Lane and then to online. Governor, are you online? Online is a new term. We have <laughs> Lane and online, so, okay. Are you confident you have enough contact tracers working right now? Uh, I, I haven't seen the data. Today, but as of a couple days ago, I think we had 147 people working. Uh, and with this new capacity coming from Blue Cross Blue Shield, I mean, one of the things that, again, we, um, when you're doing this for the first time, uh, didn't realize how long it takes to try to reach people with a negative. I mean, if you're making thousands of calls a day and, you're, and you've got a rule that says, hey, we're just not gonna leave a message to someone, we actually wanna uh, confirm who they are and you're trying to make a live to live contact. So again, really appreciate Blue Cross Blue Shield stepping in and helping on the, the calls on the negative side. But I, I feel we're good. I think at one point we had trained almost 300 people. And so with our active number of cases going down, the active cases going down, then we've got less, people that we actually have to trace. So I feel like we're in, in as good a shape. I mean, we're as well, we're, we're as good a shape there as anyone. And I would also again say, um, this is an unusual time because just about everything we get to do now, you get to compare what are the other 49 states doing in real time. And there are other states, you know, that have used their coronavirus dollars to sign, you know, huge contracts, 40 million bucks with some firm to do contact tracing. I mean, it's like, wow. And we're, you know, we, we trained up uh, students and teachers members here and got, I mean, so we're getting it, we're getting it done, we're getting it done well, and we're getting it done in a very cost effective way. So, you know, kudos to the, to everybody that's involved in contact tracing. So shout out to uh, Vern Doss and, and that whole crew. <clears throat> Lane, on lane, we're on lane right now. Governor, when we've had issues with testing machines in previous uh, months and weeks, 
it seems as though we've still gotten over a thousand tests completed, yet this time with the software malfunction, we got a little over 300. Can you tell us a little bit more exactly what this software malfunction was and how it affected these machines? Well, and, and again, Lane, maybe I wasn't super clear as I was zipping through that, but we actually did. This was the testing machines all worked. Uh, we had... Um, a, I think it was close to 1,800 tests that got completed yesterday, but then between when the tests got completed and when they got entered into the reporting system, that's where the software malfunction was. And I actually, we, they're, they're doing some more, uh, um, uh, they're doing some more, it was, I'm sorry, it was, it was 1,800 tests, but that included out of jurisdiction, a whole bunch of other stuff. In terms of the numbers that we count for North Dakota, it was about 1,300 tests and 11 positives is what got done yesterday. So it was a, a, a it was part of the record week, but it was the, the shortest day of the week, but that was more because it was Monday coming off of a slow Sunday test collection. But the issue is an IT one, not the lab equipment worked great, the lab team worked great, they processed all the tests that, that came in, those uh, 1,300 with the, uh, approximately 1,300 with the 11 positives. But where, where the data all comes together into the reporting system, uh, there was a, a batch size issue, and so there was a cache and it filled up, and it and it got stuck, and then the thing crashed, and uh, you know people worked hard all night to try to get the thing going again, and they uh, and so I appreciate them doing that, but we have to take a look at that. But this is what happens even with IT, just like other physical systems, when you stress them with larger volumes, then you can uncover uh, things that work when you've got low volumes and don't work when you have high volumes. And so I think we're gonna there'll, there'll be some you know memory caching and other changes they make to make sure this doesn't happen again. But uh, this is you know when we when we have a uh, uh, situations like this, uh, we get you know smarter and stronger coming out of it. I wish we could, I w I w you know, if, if it was a world where you could beta test everything, uh, that'd be great. But we're in the middle of a pandemic, so we had to, we had to build the stuff and use it without an opportunity to do any of the the testing of these systems. But it also reflects the fact that in the lab, uh, we we did have a number of systems which are are aged that need to be replaced. I mean, that's, I mean, we've got both in uh, DEQ where we had a strat review this week and in, uh, in the lab system, we've got lab systems that are actually uh, the, the uh, laboratory information or the limb system uh, are in DOS. And you probably have to be my age to know what that actually means, but that is a <laughs> ancient operating system from the 1980s. So it's shockingly, we still have some systems that way. So that is also part of the problem is the age, age of the systems that we're trying to patch together. But again, I just see that as opportunity. Okay, uh, online. <clears throat> Uh, Dave Kolpak with the AP in Fargo. Are there any business restrictions still in place? And if so, when do you anticipate lifting those or reaching the new normal? Uh, Dave, thanks for uh, listening in. Uh, we have on our five stage uh, risk assessment, we're in the uh, green, which is the low risk. Uh, blue is the uh, 100% uh, open. We're in, we're in green. Uh, I. We would expect that we will stay in green. Uh, you know, th we will, I mean, we'll probably touch base on this as we get into July, but uh, we don't have any um, of the 11 gating criteria that we had. Um, we don't have uh, any of the counties that are that are uh, above nine of the 11 gating count to go to blue. Uh, and it's sort of a patchwork when you start working your way back to, you know, eight of the nine, seven of the nine. Uh, and again, with that, that, that patchwork can be thrown off because of low po a few cases in a low population area. So again, we're, uh, we may get to a spot uh, before the end of the summer where the whole state can move in one swoop from green, uh, green to blue. The primary, uh, situations in terms of what would be holding back and, and you can find all this under the North Dakota Smart uh, Restart Guidelines uh, and you can find that you know, on the Commerce website. You can go to ndresponse.gov uh, and find those guidelines but it has to do with the uh, uh, you know percentage occupancy indoor at bars and restaurants is one of the one of those uh, factors that is affected between blue and green and the other is the size of large gathering and events uh, but again if you're, you have a large gathering and event whether it's a uh, like we've got some speedways, uh, you know, that are around the state that have safely reopened and are doing a great job. But you know, whether it's Red River Valley Speedway and at the fairgrounds in Fargo or up in Grand Forks, those people worked hard. They worked with local public health. They got uh, special approval. They're you know holding their regular events. They're they're uh, you know sitting people at a distance, and they've got you know quite large attendance.
students at those. So those are those are all working. I know that uh, that Mandan um, is uh, and in, in, uh, was in communication with Chad Berger, uh, you know the the uh, great stock owner operator uh, nationally for PBR. They're working to get the the Mandan rodeo going, even though the parade is closed. So that's an event that they'll work with with uh, Morton County and with Mandan. So there are uh, there are very few things that are affected, but uh, you know, full seating inside of a bar and restaurant is one of those things. Uh, but again, I would again say uh, kudos to all of the bar and restaurant owners that have developed new business plans that are um, including uh, working with cities, cities and their location to add more outdoor seating. Uh, would continue to encourage all the city officials for, for flexibility on that, whether it's sidewalk or outdoor dining for people that haven't had it in the past. And I know a number of people are reporting that they're doing great takeaway business. And, and, uh, and even, even as last weekend, I heard some restaurants in the state were doing business on Saturday like it was Valentine's Day or, or some other you know, like huge event. So I mean, I feel like a number of these groups are really back and hopefully they can and just keep doing great business like that through uh, July while we continue to assess whether we go that final step or not. <clears throat> okay, one more online. And then Dave, did you have one or? Okay. Sydney Mook with the Grand Forks Herald. What support is North Dakota University System receiving from your office or the State Health Department to ensure campuses are safe this fall as students return? Well, our uh, a couple of things are going on. One is there's a, a, a the North Dakota University system, university system, the 11 campuses has a, uh, their own task force that is uh, working uh, on their own uh, North Dakota smart higher education restart plan. And that's led by Dr. Josh Wynn. Uh, Dr. Josh Wynn, the VP of health services, uh, University of North Dakota, also the Dean of the med school. So that's what he's doing for for part of his job that relates to being Dean of the Med School. The other half of his job, as you know, we announced right here is half time he's working on leading the, uh, the, the statewide North Dakota health strategy. And in that context, he's in regular contact with our office and the state health officer, Andrew Stahl, Tammy Miller in our office, uh, the, uh, the chief operating officer, we're all working together and he's assembled a, a core uh, steering group of great uh, medical leaders from the uh, from the two universities. Uh, and then we're gonna be expanding that as we work on the health strategy. So there's a really tight correction right now uh, between that. And then of course also uh, with the, you know, Jace Beeler uh, in the governor's office, myself and, and uh, Dr. Hagerot, as in PhD, Dr. Hagerot, uh, the uh, chancellor of the North Dakota University System, uh, again, working close in conjunction with them. Uh, we still have, uh, again, in the same vein of K-12, uh, there's a lot of learning nationally of how university systems are opening up. Uh, and so we can gain a lot of learning from other organizations. In some cases, uh, the, uh, you know, the age and potential vulnerability of, of faculty at universities may even be uh, it'd be of more risk uh, because of people with people that work uh, extended careers in university settings, uh, perhaps uh, to, you know, for longer, for more number of years than they might in K-12. And so we, we have to be really thoughtful again about bringing back that many students who may be um, asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic and putting them back with faculty and staff uh, that may represent a, a vulnerable population. So there'll be plenty of things to think about. And one of the things which is also un, um, undetermined is the role of testing. Uh, there needs to be some more debates there because again, when, as I've said before, when we get all the, so we say we got 45,000 students, if 10,000 of them are living in dorms, uh, then that would be in a congregate living equivalent to the size of our, of our uh, long-term care. And whenever you've got uh, very active people that could be asymptomatic uh, living in congregate living, you know, that, that could represent some challenges. And so again, uh, I know that a number of the, the other universities around the nation are really thinking through their testing strategy and their own campus health strategies. Because uh, again, same thing we talked about in K-12, they got to have a whole new set of issues related to health of students and faculty. At the same time, they've got to figure out how to deliver education and have educational uh, value. And I think again, 
again, we'll see a lot of the, the, the blended model. There were dollars that were significant dollars that were approved. I think it was close to $45 million approved by the Emergency Commission last week as part of the Coronavirus Relief Fund that are going towards higher education to help them with both the health issue, help them with uh, moving more classes online for the blended model and helping to prepare them for uh, students returning in the fall. So significant investment of the federal stimulus dollars going back into to higher ed. Okay, Dave. So I'm just curious, um, how is the city of Arthur doing in, in the census? Uh, I, you know, they're not in the top 25, and I probably should uh, uh, check with my cousins on that, see what's up on that, see if we can get them in there. But <clears throat> if anybody could get to 100, we could. We, I think we get that done in an hour if we just drove around town. So we should be able to be in the leader. Let me check on that one. <clears throat> Okay, with that, uh, I think we've made it to the end, but thank you for that, uh, thanks for that question. And again, uh, we we'll appreciate everybody being here. And if you're hung in through all the questions, again, if you're a North Dakotan uh, that's been uh, watching online, thank you for being North Dakota smart. Uh, and thank you for everything you're doing to help save lives and livelihoods. Have a great rest of a beautiful North Dakota day. Take care.